we'll provide a few a few poll questions about mountain goats for you uh, for you to answer during the presentation. And at, at a certain point in the, in the presentation, uh, we'll break to Britta, who will talk about the uh, efforts that uh, Friends of Scotchman's Peak is doing to keep safe hiking experience for people in the mountain goats in our mountain goat country, especially on Scotchman's Peak. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Laura Wolf. She has been uh, a wildlife biology, bi biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game for 13 years. She's based out of Coeur d'Alene. She works primarily with big game species such as deer, elk, moose, wolves, and mountain lions, but is really excited when she gets to work with mountain goats. Laura also works regularly with the US Forest Service on large scale habitat projects. She manages the Snow Peak Wildlife Management Area along the North Fork of the Clearwater River, which is home to a healthy herd of mountain goats. And she recently led the statewide mountain goat management plan for the state of Idaho. So with that introduction, I will turn the time over to Laura and, and later to Britta. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here and get to talk to you guys about my favorite uh, wildlife species, which is mountain goats. I'm going to share my screen. How is that looking for everyone? Looks good. Great. So I'm going to start off with a poll question jump right into it. <clears throat> and Britt is helping with the poll. You should be able to see a poll up. We're asking folks to let me know if you've seen mountain goats in Idaho, specifically in Idaho. Just kind of curious. It's always fun when you get to see them because they are just such a unique uh, species, a neat animal um, that resides across the western United States into Canada and Alaska. Um, Looks like most people have voted. We've got 73%, oh, 70 percent have seen them in Idaho, 30 percent have not. Um, so uh, quite a few folks have seen mountain goats in Idaho, which is great. Um, and obviously there's lots of other states you can see them too. So I'm gonna get started. So mountain goats uh, are just a really unique animal. They are found in the steepest and rockiest habitats in North America. Um, they are a general herbivore. They can eat just about anything, um, which is good because there's not a whole heck of a lot of, uh, of vegetation at some of those high alpine rocky sites. Uh, and they have a really unique social structure that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I'm going to throw up another slide before I get into this is more of a you don't have to know the answer, but just kind of to see what you guys think. Um, so poll question number two is at what age are mountain goats mature? And by mature, that usually means at what age uh, are they starting to reproduce? So are mountain goats fully mature by the age of one, two, three, or four? You'll see me glancing to my left because I can see the answers popping up. All right. The majority wins. So we have about half the folks guess that they mature at the age of four, which is correct. It is, it is quite old. Um, compared to most other ungulates that mature usually and have their first young at about two, two and a half, mountain goats do not typically have their first kid until they're about four and a half years old. So that's pretty old for a, an ungulate or a hooved mammal. And um, this graphic kind of shows the size differences uh, from left being the uh, full-grown adult male and female, or Billy and Nanny, mountain goat, to the right where you see the young kid. So kids tend to be about a third the size of an adult in their first six months. Um, and even by a year old, they're still only about half the size of an adult, which is unusual. Most ungulates like deer and elk are close to the size of an adult by the time they're a year old. Uh, even two-year-old mountain goats are still considerably smaller than than in an adult. So you can use size to uh, determine their age for the first couple years, but if you, once you get past two um, and you're in the two to 10 age range, you really need to be able to uh, look at their uh, horns to determine the age. So if you see me um, on the side of your screen, I'm holding up a mountain goat skull and mountain goat horns have rings just like trees do. So they have uh, the first year they grow the most horn 
quite a bit of their hormones grown in the first year. The second year they grow a noticeable amount. And then after that years uh, three through however old they live, um, they really only grow maybe a quarter inch or less. So those rings get really close together, but you can count them and determine how old they are by those age rings, just like a big horn sheep has. Mountain goats look very similar, males and females do, um, but you can also use their horns to figure out if they're a male or a female. So um, males have slightly larger bases. So the, um, the very bottom part of the horn is pretty wide and it's so wide that you would not be able to stick another horn in between the two horns. Whereas a female, which I'm holding a female mountain goat skull, um, females do have a little bit more space. They have narrower horns, so you could actually fit another horn in between the two. Um, these are very slight differences though. Um, the other thing is to look at how hooked the end of the horn is. So females tend to have a little bit more of a crook, a little hooked uh, end to the curvature of the horn. But again, these are hard, even if, you're, uh, if you have a skull in hand, it can be somewhat tricky to determine um, the sex of the goat. So I always recommend uh, watching them for a while. And if you see testicles, you know it's a male. Um, and if you watch them urinate, you can also tell whether it's a male or female. So those are really the best ways to determine. It takes a little bit longer to watch them though. So as I mentioned, mountain goats live in just really steep, rocky habitats. Um, not a lot of other animals in North America live in these habitat types. And they select these areas because it is uh, a great uh, place to be safe from predators. Um, when they're in the rocks, they're pretty safe from most of the uh, large mammalian predators that, that may uh, get them. They do wander off the rocks uh, to access forage or to travel to new areas, and that's when they're at a bit more risk um, from predation. Um, but they are able to find um, forage in these cliffy areas. Um, the other reason that they choose these areas is that uh, snow does not accumulate in winter, so they can move around on these rocky cliffs without having to travel through deep snow, even when they're at these really high elevations. Um, because alpine environments like this have a fairly short growing season, they can, if they're in very high numbers, deplete their food resources, um, which can take quite a while to, to recover. They do eat a lot of different have a lot of different foods though. I mean, they eat just about anything they can find at high elevation. So conifer needles, leaves, orbs, wildflowers, lichens. Um, it's pretty much anything that they they wander by, they they can eat and will eat. So here's a great example of uh, winter habitat. This picture was taken uh, actually this last winter. Um, this is the Cabinet Mountains just east of Scotchman in Montana. Um, the cabinets in the Idaho side actually is pretty limited in terms of winter habitat, but Montana has really nice um, rocky cliffs from top to bottom of the mountains. Uh, one of the reasons that mountain goats are able to move around so efficiently and use these environments when other uh, animals are not is based on their hooves. And their ho hooves are really interesting because um, they have, which uh, the photo shows, they have a hard keratin outer part of the hoof, um, which would be like the hoof of a deer or a horse. But unlike a deer where the whole hoof is that hard keratin, which would make it very slippery on steep, slick rocks, um, the inner part of the hoof is a bit softer and actually has kind of a rough texture if you were to feel it. Um, which provides friction when they're walking on ice or walking on slick rocks. The other really cool thing about them is that um, unlike a deer hoof that the two uh, fingers of the hoof stay, the toes basically, the toes stay together when they're walking, mountain goats are able to um, hold their, their toes out in kind of a V shape. So I'll, I'm going to ask you to try this right now. So put your two fingers together, and I can't tell if you're doing this or not, but I'm going to assume you are. Put your two fingers together and then put it on a flat surface like a table or the floor, and then just push, push forward, slide your fingers forward and feel how that feels. And once you've done that, then put your toes in a mountain goat V as if you're on a steep slope, and then try to push your fingers uh, along a slope in the V. And you should notice that it is much more difficult 
to push forward when you have the V. So that just goes to show that when you can do that with your with your toes, you you are providing more friction. Um, it makes it much harder for them to slide. The other thing about the V that helps is that they can catch like little nooks, rocks, snow can get caught in the middle of the V, which can help uh, add an additional break if they're starting to the foot is starting to slide. So that helps them move around in these slick and steep rocks. Um, they also have very powerful neck and shoulder muscles that help them climb up these steep slopes. Um, and they can have amazing jump uh, abilities too. They can jump as far as 12 feet. So they're pretty, pretty amazing animals to, wa to watch in the rocks. All right, we're gonna do another poll. So this map is showing uh, mountain goat populations across the state of Idaho. Uh, the poll question is, which North Idaho mountain goat herd is an, an introduced herd or a non-native herd? So we have the Selkirks, the Cabinets, uh, the Bernard Peak, uh, Lake Ponderé herd, and the Mallard Larkins. Those are our four herds in North Idaho. Just watching the, watching the votes coming in, about half the folks have voted. Yeah, we got a lot of different, a lot of different answers. Um, so most folks selected um, the Mallard Larkins, which is the Snow Peak uh, area, south of Snow Peak. Um, but mo the, the winner is Bernard Peak. So the, the goats that you can see from, um, from Bayview across the lake, across from Farragut, where the fire currently is burning, um, is actually our only non-native goat herd. It was actually the first translocated herd in the state of Idaho in 1960. Um, but the Cabinets and the Selkirks and the, the Mallard Larkins are all native mountain goat herds that have been there, as long as we know. Hey, Laura. Um, yeah. Ken had a question. How oh, do thank you decide you. where they are native? So a lot of that is based on historical reports. Um, when people uh, were traveling through in the uh, 1800s where they reported seeing mountain goats and where they did not. Um, and there were no known goats or nobody reported seeing goats in the Bernard Peak area um, of all the settlers that came into or uh, talking to native uh, Native Americans that lived in the area at the time. So there, there are some places where there's a little bit of question that might even be close to like some of the stuff in the um, just north of central Idaho. We have some questions as to whether or not goats are native there or not. Um, uh, but in the case of north Idaho, we're pretty certain as to which areas are native and which are not. Um, our Selkirk, Selkirk goat herds uh, extend up into Canada. Um, there's, there's not a dividing line on the border. Uh, same with the cabinets, those extend into Montana where they are very large native herds. But that's a great question and thanks. I don't, I, I don't see the chat box right now. So if you can go ahead and let me know when I have questions, that would be helpful. So this map um, shows all the locations that we know of uh, since 1954. And as you can see, uh, the majority of the mountain goats reside in central Idaho um, in the Frank Church Wilderness. Uh, the largest mountain goat herds are in the Sawtooth and White Clouds, those two big bunches of red dots you see at the southern end. Um, and then the most populous non-native herd is over by Idaho Falls on the Wyoming border, that's the Palisades herd. So as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the cool things about mountain goats is they have, uh, I think, kind of interesting social structure um, and behavior compared to other ungulates like deer and elk that, that live in the state. Um, mountain goats typically are found in nanny groups. So the, especially the bigger groups are gonna be females with young, including young billies um, and kids. And the adult billies will typically be um, separate from these herds by themselves or maybe with one or two other adult billies. And um, basically, the larger and the older the mountain goat, the more dominant they are. So their social structure is based on mostly size, 
somewhat, which is generally correlated with age, but the bigger the goat, the, the more dominant. And, and you see a lot of these social interactions less often in the billy groups, but more often in these nanny groups where um, the, the larger nannies and the, and the older nannies are going to be uh, dominant, kind of the boss, they get to control the situation. Um, the, the billies will come into these nanny groups to breed. Nannies are pretty intolerant of having them around for very long, so it's a very short window where they'll come in and breed in during the November rep. Um, mound goats have kind of a personal bubble. It extends roughly six feet from their head, and they don't really like other goats to be within that bubble, their kid being excluded while they're young and nursing. Um, so if two goats encounter each other, maybe on a ledge or on a path, the, the subordinate goat will let the dominant go by. But if they're roughly the same size or they're feeling cocky that day, um, they might not move. And so then you get into a kind of posturing situation. Now, mountain goats, as we all know, have very sharp horns that they can use for jabbing. And they do have um, tough rump patches to help protect from jabs that they might receive. Uh, however, they rarely use those horns um, with each other. They do, unlike like a bighorn sheep, which you always see, you know, videos of rams interacting with their horns. Mountain goats are very unlikely to use their horns um, with another goat. That's kind of the last, the last thing that they would do. So they do a lot of posturing, which might be moving their head how big their horns are. It might be standing sideways to look bigger, saying I actually am dominant. They might poof out their the hair along their legs to again, kind of like a cat would poof their hair out to make them look bigger. Um, and if that, that doesn't encourage the other goat to move along, then maybe they would kind of do a little jab. But for the most part, that's gonna kind of be this, how this posturing works to figure out who's dominant. So, I am going to read half a page from one of my favorite books, which is Doug Chadwick's A Beast, The Color of Winter, because I thought it was a, just a really neat description of the social hierarchy of, of mountain goats. So Doug Chadwick, um, in this book, he spent uh, quite a few years, mostly in Canada, observing goats and, and recording behaviors. So it's a lot of behavioral ecology. So he's watching um, a group of goats, um, watching them with, with his spotting scope. A fairly large group of adult nannies and immature goats lie bedded on a favorite stone turret overlooking the forest. Among them, a three-year-old nanny, I know as number 100, stretches out drowsily, chewing her cud, her kid beside her doing the same. Her head is only about four feet from the rump of a larger nanny who has a kid with her, but since the goats seem to measure their personal perimeter outward from their head, number 100 is safely just beyond the big nanny's trespass zone. She is, that is, until the female gets up and turns 100 degrees to rebed. Now the heads of the two nannies are not eight feet apart, but four feet. What has been an association turns into a confrontation with the big nanny staring steadily at number 100. Number 100 and her kid are forced to rise and leave. It is typical of these crag dwellers that they consider the bed of a lower ranking companion more appealing than an unoccupied site. Number 100 accordingly walks straight over to a young Billy, a two-year-old. He gets up and after some circling and horn threats is persuaded to leave by number 100, who settles into his bed with a yawn after the usual preliminary pawing. Her kid does the same and curls up beside her, then lazily extends a foreleg and begins chewing its cud. The two-year-old Billy now heads directly for a slightly smaller two-year-old nanny who jumps up from her bed and leaves after a quick horn toss in the Billy's direction. While the Billy lies down in the bed he has usurped, she is taking out her aroused aggression on a dwarf fir tree, which she thoroughly slashes. A few moments later, she is kicking a yearling male out of his bed. This displaced yearling tries to take over another yearling Billy's bed spot, but is discouraged by the other's violent pawing and the rigid present threat he performs while still lying down. A present threat being kind of a, look how big I am sideways. And so the smallest yearling in the band, hapless last link in the chain, bottom rung on the ladder and low goat on the totem pole is left standing to pick out a new bedside. 
that's just one of my favorite uh, examples of how the hierarchy works. So while most of the time goats, like most wild animals, are uh, afraid of uh, people and will move away, they do become habituated when fed or offered salt, either from urine deposits or people's salty backpacks and skin. Uh, these photos, uh, courtesy of Britta, are uh, from Scotchman's Peak, people uh, behaving poorly with the mountain goats. Um, and unfortunately, when mountain goats are no longer acting like wild mountain goats, um, they let people into their personal bubble, which can sometimes uh, turn uh, into a problem. We did have a hiker who was injured in 2015 when he let a mountain goat get too close to him. And uh, a hiker was actually killed in Olympic National Park in 2010 when unfortunately he did the right thing and, and was not going to give the mountain goat his sandwich. Um, and, and that turned deadly. So they can be, while they tend not to use their horns, when they do, um, they can be quite dangerous. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Britta because it seems like a good spot to talk about the uh, ambassador program on Scotchman Peak. Thanks, Laura. Hey, let me pull up my slides so everyone can see them. And share my screen. All right. Um, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Okay, I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> Um, so, um, like Preston and Laura said, my name is Britta Meyerly. I'm with Friends of Scotchman Peaks Wilderness. And you speak up. Oh, yep, sorry, I definitely can. Thank you. Um, and this is one of the lovely goats on Scotchman Peak. Uh, as Laura was talking about, they really do um they've gotten a little bit habituated and as it turns out they really like salt um which is a problem um this person laid their pack down at the summit and after hiking scotchman peak you tend to get a bit sweaty and uh that can lead to sweaty backpack straps and to a mountain goat carrying your pack off and people um can let them get a bit too close, um, including for that perfect up the snout close up shot. So um, after the hiker was injured in 2015, um, our executive director, Phil Huff, that I think all of you know well, um, partnered with, worked with Eric, um, Eric Walker, who was our district ranger on the Panhandle National Forest in the Sand Point District at the time, and with Idaho Fish and Game, and came up with this idea for a trail ambassador program. The idea is to have volunteers hiking Scotchman Peak during the summer um, on the weekends and holidays when there tend to be the most people, and um, talk to folks about the goats and why it's so important to keep them at a distance. Um, and ideally, we would like to see no, no people taking selfies, letting the goats lick their ears. Um, but realistically, we're looking to keep people safe and keep the trail open um, without having the Forest Service and Idaho Fish and Game having to take any lethal action with goats or close the trail again. Anybody can be an ambassador. Um, this is a picture of some folks hiking a few years ago and uh, our trail ambassador coordinator that year, Mary Franzel on the right. Um, all of the amb ambassadors are volunteers and we have a few of them on the, on the call today. So thank you. Um, Susan Fates Harbuck is rocking the mountain goat background um, on her virtual background on her screen. So I appreciate that. 
Uh, so some of the program highlights. Uh, since 2016, when the first when the program first started, um, 82 unique people um, have hiked as volunteers, ambassador volunteers, um, and most of those people have hiked multiple times as volunteers. Uh, they have spent a total of 1,412 hours driving, hiking, sitting um, sitting on the summit, talking to people. Just, over 1400 hours acting in that um, volunteer capac capacity, which is a lot of time considering it was only 82 people. Um, and I got a little crazy with infographics last night. <laughs> um, and I made this fun one based on boots. So these are the number of hikers that um, the ambassadors have talked to. And we didn't count how many people they talked to in 2016 and 2017. So this is only 2018, 2019, and 2020 so far. And if you'll notice, so each boot is 300 hikers. Um, for 2020, that's only two months worth of ambassador days. So July, 4th of July through Labor Day. Um, we didn't start the program until July this year because of COVID and wanting to make sure we could keep our ambassadors safe. Um, and so we implemented, wrote and implemented a COVID safety plan for all of our volunteers, including the ambassadors. Uh, but we had massive amounts of people on the trail this year. Last year, our peak day was around the 4th of July and it was with 100 people on the trail. And this year we had 120, 130 on some days, not necessarily the 4th of July weekend. So I think we've kind of concluded that people were feeling cooped up and wanted out and they decided to go for a hike with 100 other people. <laughs> uh, since we started the program, there have been zero incidents reported between mountain goats and humans. And that is a very important number to us. We wanna keep it that way. Um, we have found that since we've been doing the program long enough, we're starting to have ambassadors that aren't official ambassadors. So they've talked to the official volunteer trail ambassador that's out there, and then they see someone letting the goats get too close or approaching the goats, and they will act as an ambassador and say, no, don't do this, here's why. And so it's really starting to get that snowball effect, uh, which is wonderful. We still have one goat that is a little more um, assertive than the others, but for the most part, the goats are starting to um, to realize that maybe people aren't as easy of a target for salt as they once were. Um, and within the last few weeks, there haven't been very many goats on the summit. Um, the volunteers have been reporting like that they're only seeing one or maybe no goats at all, um, which honestly is not a bad thing. I'm sure people are disappointed about their photo op. Um, but it's good because that means the goats are steering clear of the people. Uh, put my contact information up just in case. Um, and I will, if anybody has any questions about it, um, but otherwise I'll just hand it back to Laura. Thanks, Britta. One of the questions that I often get as I'm gonna attempt to reshare my screen here is um, do goats need salt? And Oh, look, see, ha <laughs> ha. The question came in just as I was answering it. Um, mountain goats do need some salt, um, but there is enough salt in the environment that they can find. There are not like natural salt licks, so they, they can get salt from the, um, the environment. They just really like it. So when they're coming in to get salt, it is, it is less about the, the need and more about the want. So it's like our, you know, our, sugar addiction or potato chip addiction of ours that we have ourselves. Okay. How is that looking? I'm assuming that you can see a goat on a trail. Great. Okay. Um, what was that? Good? Looks good. Okay. So along the lines of um, uh, mountain goats, you know, gathering on Scotchman Peak or um, 
other places, the, there were researchers in Glacier National Park, which is one place that you may have seen goats if you haven't seen them in Idaho. Um, goats are almost always seen uh, on the top of Logan Pass where the going to the Sun Road goes from the west to the east side. And the scientists were curious as to whether mountain goats were gathering there because it's not very mountain goaty habitat right there. It's mostly meadowy. Um, that's not much for escape terrain. It's open and there's some steepness, but not necessarily a lot of rocks right there. Um, were the goats hanging out at Logan Pass because they were seeking the salt? Um, so people obviously pee along the trail, so there's salt in the soil. Uh, is it because they are finding really good forage? Um, a lot of good plants for them to eat there. Or are they using predator, uh, humans as a predator shield? So are they coming to that area because there's so many people that there's bound to be less predators? And they had mountain goats collared and they were studying them, but they had a really unique opportunity to truly answer this question when a few years ago they had to close the going to the sun road midsummer because of a wildfire. So that stopped all traffic over Logan Pass. And so all of a sudden it went from thousands of people a day to nobody um, for several weeks. Uh, they had determined already that the salt remained in the soil available to goats for 10 to 14 days. And what they found was that within two to three days, almost all the goats had left and gone back to the cliffs. So, uh, and obviously the forage did not change in that time with no people around. So that they determined the goats were actually congregating at Logan Pass because they were using people as a shield. So there's less likely to have wolves, bears, and lions hanging out when you have that many people there day to day, day after day. So I think that's a really neat thing. And I think that the, the Scotchman Peak goats, while they're probably primarily there for the salt, they might also be using um, humans as a shield there as well. Um, especially since I know there haven't been as many people hanging out uh, during that when the smoke came in a couple weeks ago. Um, I don't think the volunteers were hiking the trail, but I hope to goodness gosh that there weren't a lot of people hiking it either because it was pretty hazard, hazardous. Um, and now that they're we're getting reports that there aren't many goats at the top and obviously there's still going to be salt deposits around. So they may have left because the people weren't there as that protection. So mountain goats have been translocated, um, about 270 actually have been translocated within Idaho since 1960. Um, translocating or moving animals was a very popular thing with wildlife biologists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, it has definitely slowed down since then and has become much more uh, thoughtful. Um, this was the, the pictures here represent the last mountain goat translocation that occurred in Idaho. Um, these were goats that were brought from non-native range in Utah. Goats are not native to the state of Utah. Um, uh, up into the North Lemhi Mountains due south of Salmon, Idaho. And these were brought into that location because that is native range, but goats had not really been occupying that uh, section of the mountain range for uh, a couple decades. So we were hoping to reestablish goats in that area. Um, unfortunately, as is not uncommon with translocations, it seems like particularly when you're trying to bolster uh, a declining population or bring them back into previ previously inhabited um, range, the translocation did not go very well. Um, most of the goats died within the first three to four years from a variety of causes. Um, there are still uh, a healthy herd in the southern part of the Lemhi range, but uh, it just was a good example of um, how difficult, difficult it can be to, to reestablish. And perhaps the goats are not there because the, the forage is not uh, sufficient at this time. Maybe, maybe at some point there were uh, many, too many goats uh, or a competition with other species that were using the same forage resources. Um, but when we think about moving goats now, we, we try to make sure that uh, forage appears to be appropriate or we might be moving goats to bolster genetic diversity. A lot of goat herds are fairly small in number, um, excluding the white clouds and the, uh, the sawtooth, which those herds are in the three to 500 range. Um, many of our other, our herds could be in the 40 to 80 range, which is, is pretty small. 
as we mentioned before, um, there are a variety of um, ways that mountain goats may perish, um, predators being the, the most common and of those mountain lions being the main predator. They do tend to also like to inhabit rocky areas and rocky outcroppings and as a stealth predator they, they are the, the main cause of death with mountain goats in Idaho anyway. Um, when they wander off the rocks they may encounter wolves um, and grizzly bears and golden eagles have actually been known to take kids from rocks as well. Falls and avalanches are um, also not an uncommon cause of death even though they are pretty spectacular on those rocks they not uncommon for them to, to fall or to be killed in the winter uh, with by an avalanche. Other threats that mountain goats are seeing now um, include climate change. Um, I think we have a poll question here for you. So our warmer winters which are predicted to spread across um, north and most of mountain goat habitat. Um, should our warmer winters due to climate change likely to increase overwinter mountain goat survival or decrease overwinter survival? It's fun to watch people answer the poll questions. The picture here on the screen is of um, a uh, mountain goat, goat up on Scotchman this summer who was enjoying a snow patch. All right, so we've got 13 votes for decrease overwinter survival and five votes for increase overwinter survival. So this might be surprising, but warmer winters actually should benefit mountain goats in the wintertime. While they do live in very snowy places, they do better if there's less snow. So they don't need lots of snow like a uh, wolverine needs snow to insulate or a pika needs snow to insulate their um, their dens in the wintertime. Mountain goats do not need snow to do well. However, warmer summers and particularly warmer drier summers are likely to decrease survival in the summertime. So they might have an increased survival over winter because of less snow. It's going to it's going to be even worse in the summertime when they have both uh, changes in plants. I, I think many of these alpine plants are gonna desiccate earlier when you have these uh, warmer, drier summers. So they're gonna lose their forage earlier. And two, they are gonna be heat stressed. So um, mountain goats like this one here on Scotchman, they do seek out snow patches throughout the summer to cool off. And without those snow patches, um, they have to choose whether they seek out shade or snow somewhere else or they stay in the place where they can find the best forage. And so having those, making those trade-offs is going to potentially um, put them into poorer body condition going into the following winter. Um, they did a study of mountain goats again in Glacier where they found that goats were specifically seeking out these snow patches that were remaining in, in July and August to cool off. And when they did not have snow patches available, if they had already melted, their respiration rates were uh, significantly higher. So that means that they're using more energy um, just to cool off panting um, than they would if they had a snow patch. So it is, a, it is a stress for them during the summer months. This graphic um, is based on a model in, in Southeast Alaska, but I think it's pretty relevant anywhere in North America. Um, as we know, many species are gonna be moving north um, or up in elevation as the climate warms. And unfortunately for mountain goats, mountains are pyramid shaped and not like a skyscraper shape. So as they go up, they are gonna have less habitat available to them, um, even if they, if they can move up. Some of them are already at, at the tops of the mountains. So that is not gonna be uh, helpful. So we have habitat loss along with general physiological stress of uh, warming temperatures. Another thing that can impact mountain goats is recreation. I'm gonna throw up another poll here. Well, Britta is. Britta's gonna throw up another poll. So what do you think mountain goats um, are most disturbed by in terms of uh, uh, human recreation? So ATVs, helicopters, hikers, or truck traffic? There have been a number of studies um, done on, on mountain goats and, and disturbance, and, and some of these studies are ongoing now. Um, there's a neat study that was 
mostly looking at um, recreation use in terms of uh, wolverine habitat in, in central Idaho, but it, it's somewhat relevant to mountain goats because they inhabit some of the same uh, habitat types. All right, so uh, the majority of folks, but half the folks voted for ATVs, followed by five for helicopters and uh, four for hikers. So um, the most research we have shows that they're most disturbed by helicopters. And we don't know, and we can see that too when we do surveys, which of course we try not to um, stay near them for more than a couple seconds as soon as we can get a count, we're out of there. Um, but unlike other ungulates, which don't love hel helicopters either, they, they seem to be um, most bothered by them. Um, they're pretty darn good at hiding in cracks and caves where you can't even see them. Um, they won't come back out either. They, they are quite bothered by helicopters. Um, I didn't include s over snow machines just because I can't, I don't know that we have a good comparison between helicopters and let's say snow machines or snow bikes, but, um, but mountain goats certainly do move um, to different areas when they're disturbed by motorized recreation. Um, they may also move based on hikers as well, but it seems like they're more disturbed by motorized rec. Um, they, um, they're, they're most bothered during uh, winter when they're in wintering areas because that's the time of year where they use a pretty small area. They don't move around very much and uh, they're really just trying to conserve energy. So like you can see that sign, we have winter, winter, mountain goats wintering in this area, please don't recreate. Um, having closures can help. Um, biologists in the state are becoming increasingly concerned about snow bikes because they are able to access areas that snow machines never have been able to. So you can be up in a really high elevation remote basin that you wouldn't think anybody could get to and you have snow bike tracks going just right below mountain goat cliffs. So um, the concern is that they might abandon the habitat altogether or just expend more energy trying to move away from, from that disturbance. So as Preston mentioned, um, we just finished the Idaho Mountain Goat Management Plan for the state of Idaho. Um, it had not been updated in over 20 years, so it was definitely time to revisit um, our goals and strategies for managing mountain goats in the state. Um, much of the strategies involve working with the U.S. Forest Service um, because almost all the goats in Idaho do reside on Forest Service land. Um, it provides guidance for wildlife managers. Uh, mountain goats are legally harvested in the state. Uh, currently we have 44 mountain goat tags. Um, but this plan moved to a much more conservative harvest strategy statewide. Um, Mountain goats have known to be um, easily overharvested for many years. I think a lot of the herds across the West were um, overharvested, particularly in the 50s and 60s when there were very general open seasons. Um, now we still have concerns across the West. Um, Montana's probably done the best job at documenting declines in many of their native mountain goat herds, um, even while non-native herds are doing well. For whatever reason, um, and it does not appear to be related to harvest at this point because most harvest is quite low. Um, for example, we have probably minimum 2,500, probably in the range of 3,000 goats in the state. It's a rough estimate, but um, we probably harvest maybe 35 goats out of 3,000 a year, so it's, it's not likely impacting the herds at this time, but we wanted to move to a recommendation of um, populations being at least uh, 100 goats before harvest was allowed. Um, when we redid this plan and was approved by the commission, um, the one mountain goat tag that was in North Idaho was um, removed. And so not surprisingly, hunters were quite interested in how many goats we really had in the Selkirks and cabinets since we had not surveyed since 2001. Um, so we did a survey this February and um, using a fixed wing, uh, excuse me, not a fixed wing, using a helicopter, we have two observers and a pilot, um, and we fly uh, elevational contours in all the rocky habitats in the mountains. So we will just fly along um, all the rocky uh, cliffy bits uh, up to the top, or sometimes we start at the top, go to the bottom. Um, 
it's interesting. I've spent a lot of time uh, surveying mountain goats in other parts of the state where they often are found right at the tops of the mountains on the ridge lines. But here in North Idaho, our wet snow does not allow for there to be any mountain goat habitat at, at the top of those mountains. Uh, you've got 12 foot cornices. So almost all the goats were found in rocky outcroppings about a thousand feet below the, the ridge lines. Um, they do obviously use the ridge lines in the summertime, but um, it just was, it was quite interesting because down in the, uh, the central part of the state, you have, uh, I think, much drier snow. So those ridge lines are clear of, of snow. Um, some folks like to fly mountain goats or survey mountain goats in the spring when they're on green up, um, where you have goats coming out into open slopes and gathering. We don't have a whole lot of that habitat here in North Idaho. So it's really beneficial to fly them in the winter when you can use tracks to help find them. Uh, you can see in this photograph, um, when we're flying, the first thing our eyes go to are all the tracks that are running around in the cliffs. And so the only, about the only other tracks we saw in most of this habitat were snowshoe hair tracks, which look nothing like mountain goat tracks. So it was pretty easy to say, okay, there's definitely a goat here. So you have to look close, but if you can uh, squeeze your eyes into the lower of those two big rocks and you'll see two goats. There might be more in this picture I'm trying to look, but there's at least two. Oh, there's three. There's actually three tucked in on that lower rock. Um, so we counted 57 mountain goats in the Selkirks, um, which was considerably higher than the 2001 count of 34 goats. So um, of interest, uh, I talked a little bit about translocation before. So there were actually 31 goats that were moved from Snow Peak area, just in, just uh, north of the Mallard Lurkins into the Selkirks between 1980 and 1994. And when we counted them in 2001, we counted 34. So there were almost no more than what had been translocated into the Selkirks. Um, we counted 57 this time. Uh, I feel like not only did we probably do a bit more of a complete survey, but the population does appear to be increasing. So that is really good news. Uh, recruitment was 12 kids per 100 adults. So like I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to, to sex a goat to determine if it's a male or female. Um, you pretty much, I mean, I don't know if I've ever been able to do it from a helicopter. So um, we look at recruitment in terms of how many kids per adults and uh, 12 is a little bit less than we'd like to see, but of course it can be quite variable from year to year. Um, so we flew from the Canadian border down to Toothmouth Creek where we found goats. Um, goats have never been seen south of Harrison Lake that I know of. There's been no reports, which is interesting. It looks like really good mountain goat habitat in the summer, but maybe the winter habitat is not nearby, so they don't hang out there very often. Um, and then there's quite a few goats in the Farnham Ridge area between Parker Ridge and Ball Creek, just off the Kootenai Valley, which is kind of unique. And those goats are seen alongside mule deer and moose, so they're kind of intermixed in that, that spot. Hey, Laura, we have a quick yeah. question from Molly. Yeah. Are drones a possible replacement, full or partial, for helicopters in surveying? That's a really great question. So um, the state of Idaho has been really looking into all sorts of other ways to survey wildlife because helicopters are um, not only expensive and bothersome, but they're actually the most dangerous thing that a wildlife biologist does. Um, we are flying in, you know, low to the ground, slow in winter, mountains so it's it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, currently there are restrictions on drones that require you to be within a mile line sight of the drone so it doesn't it would not be at this time a viable option but it is certainly something that is um, on the table and I can imagine that we would probably use drones for some wildlife surveys in the future. Um, the one thing that's tough about a drone is that when we're flying you know, sometimes, you, so you're, a lot of times you're seeing tracks and then you're having to kind of track back to find the goat. Is it one goat? Is it three? Is it a nanny with a kid? So with a drone, you would have to be like live, look, watching the video and directing the drone to be able to effectively find the animals that you're looking for. Not to say, I'm sure that will be possible at some point, but we're not quite there yet. Follow up from Phil. Yeah. Montana has used fixed wing aircraft for the cabinet mountain surveys. Would that be better? No. Um, 
helicopters are the best, you have the best visibility into like the, I'm gonna go back to the picture. Oops, too far. The bubble ship, this, these uh, Bell 47s or Hillers have the absolute, absolute best visibility of anything. When you're in a fixed wing, you have much smaller windows. You can't really see as much like down. You're in these steep, steep, cliffy areas. So sometimes you're looking for things that are right below you. So in this ship, you can see like, I'm the person in the orange right there. You can see below your feet. So you have really good visibility. Um, sightability in other ships, uh, it, other types of helicopters are not as good. So like when we compare this survey to the one done in 01, in 01 we were using a different kind of helicopter that didn't have as good a visibility, which may have been part of the reason the number was a bit lower. And, and in a fixed wing, you have even less visibility. You have to fly faster and you can't fly as low. So you're more apt to miss animals. It can be, I feel like Montana does a lot of fixed wing flying and they can get maybe rough trend estimates on goats and deer and elk, but it's not very accurate. So we also flew the cabinet mountains. Um, we saw 11 mountain goats, which was a few less, but similar to the count in 01, which was 16 goats. Um, the majority of the mountain goat habitat and the mountain goats are in Montana. So typically when Montana flies the cabinets, they count in the west cabinets, they count the range of 50 or 60 goats. Um, and then there's even more in the, in the east cabinets. So. It was, I knew that there weren't that many in Idaho and obviously we even see more in the summertime. So they come over um, in the summer. And I mean, I think this, even the summer up at Scotchman, people were seeing 16 goats in a day. Um, and it was funny cause you know, the Montana Idaho border is straight and you wouldn't think that there would be like a big difference between one side of the line and the other. But man, that picture I showed earlier when we were talking about the hooves, that was just like right across the border and it was like bam all this mountain goat habitat i'm like oh that's why they're all over in montana it's just much more much more high quality habitat there so i uh, have another question about yeah. um the numbers of goats from pam how many up lion creek at priest lake oh pam i don't know if I can answer that. Uh, I could look it up for you and give, it, give you an answer later if you want to put your email in the chat box, but um, I was on that flight too. I'm like trying to remember. There was, it wasn't more than 10 probably, but we definitely saw a scattered groupings of them. Eight to 10 maybe. And that's all I have. So I'm, I'm happy to take more questions that you guys have come up with over the course of this hour. But I'm happy to, it was really fun to be able to talk to you about goats. I, I never turned down an opportunity to, to talk about them because I think they're really neat and I enjoy them quite a bit. And you're always welcome to either shoot me an email or give me a call at the um, Fish and Game office in Coeur d'Alene and if you have any questions or if you have sightings. So one thing, um, that map that I showed earlier with all the mountain goat observations, um, we have a, a wildlife observation page on our Fish and Game website and we will take observations of anything, any wildlife you see that you, particularly that's notable, um, uh, if you have a photograph that really helps to validate the or tracks to validate the sighting but um, so when we get we get location a lot of those locations were from the general public or other biologists that don't work for fishing game um, that were that had seen goats um, and that helps us with management of all sorts of species so hey we've got questions coming in the chat are there I can pull up the chat between mountain goats and bighorn sheep Ooh, that's a good question. I wish I could find the chat box, but I can't. <laughs> if you stop sharing your screen, you'll be able to see it. Oh, okay. I'll do that then. Oh, there you go. I was like, no wonder I couldn't see it. <laughs> um, yes. So 
in on native range, there typically doesn't tend to be a ton of overlap. Um, and even if there is, um, I wouldn't say that there are conflicts. Where there are conflicts um, are places like the Palisades um, in eastern Idaho, um, Wyoming, where mountain goats were introduced and bighorn sheep are native. And mountain goats have done very well there and are now expanding into the Tetons where they're not native and they're gonna be competing with habitat and forage with, for bighorn sheep. So um, that's where we run into problems. Or, well, this is not between bighorn and mountain goats, but like Olympic National Park has just been spending the last couple of years trying to remove mountain goats from the park because they're not native. And they're there competing with other native um, uh, mammals, but particularly the concern is with a lot of sensitive plant species that reside at the higher elevations of Olympic. And they, they were likely introduced, gosh, maybe in the, around the turn of the century, the teens, maybe the 1920s, and they expanded to 700 goats or more. I mean, just am amazing expansion. Um, all right, so next question. In translocating, have there been studies of whether the unfamiliar habitat is a major cause of mortality. Normally a goat grows up learning its home range from infancy um, with mentoring. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there haven't, but I would guess that that is probably not the problem because we have had so many translocations, like almost all the non-native herds in Montana, um, like we talked about the Palisades, those goats just exploded. Like they did really, really well in these new habitats or the Olympics or there's goats, all the goats in Utah. Like it was a spot where they'd never been. They didn't seem to have a problem with not knowing the range. So that's why my guess is that it has more to do with the habitat forage wise, like what, for them. or maybe um, if there's high predator numbers in those areas, like the goats that we moved into salmon, many of them were killed by mountain lions. Mountain lion numbers were high. Um, so it could be a, a combination of not really knowing where you are and then you're eaten by a predator because you don't know where to go or you don't know where the good, you know, escape train is. It could be part of it, but it seems like that's not a major component. Um, I think there were some above too. Um, oh, okay. Let's, ah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I get very excited when fires, um, wildfires start in the panhandle because for the most part those fires are really good for wildlife habitat. But that is not a spot that I really wanted to see a fire. Um, that is a really steep, dry hillside um, and where the fire started and much of what, what burned is actually a lot of that mountain goat habitat there. I would imagine that um, that is not going to be beneficial. I mean, though their numbers appear to be down from um, their, their peak probably in the 1970s. But I would imagine that um, a hot fire in that in yeah late summer is probably not going to be super useful for mountain goats there. Um, I was told those goats were translated translocated from Hurricane Ridge in the Cascades. Um, I'm not sure they were translocated from the Lion Creek goats. Right. No, this is the. I I think she's talking about the Olympic. So the Olympic goats, the last couple of summers, they were trying to catch as many goats as they could and move them into native range in the Cascades where they want to bolster um, declining populations. So I think they've moved close to 300 goats from the Olympics to the Cascades, which is really impressive. So they were going to catch as many as they could via helicopter um, before they moved to other methods of removing the goats. Um, you get to a point where you can't safely catch a goat and for the goat's sake or for the people who need to um, put the goat in a sling. Um, there's a lot of a lot of steep country in the Olympics. So I think that their next once they got all the goats they could get via helicopter, um, they were offering limited um, harvest hunter harvest. Um, all right. Someone wants to see the map. So I'm going to grab the map real quick. I'm going to have you, I'm going to put the map back up, Britta. Would you do questions for me? Because I'll be able to see it again. Yep. Um, are there any future issues around forage quality with climate change? I should, I should think so. Here, let me share my screen. The 
There we go. Um, I expect so, and I think that's going to be an issue with many native, um, especially ungulate species, but probably most herbivores. I think that, um, like we've been having the last five to 10 years, these long, particularly dry, like this summer was not really hotter than average, but it was particularly, it was much drier than average. So you've got vegetation that is um, drying out much earlier than it normally would. You don't have any of these like late summer, early fall rains to perk things back up. So I think that that's going to negatively impact a lot of species going into winter if they can't get their forage. If all the, if all the vegetation is available like May, June, and by mid-July you don't have much, um, you're going to have a hard time uh, having building up enough body fat to make it through winter. Okay, another question. We had a local plane owner who was buzzing the slope on Bernard on an almost daily basis, flying from lake level up the slope. Was that dangerous to the goats and where should that behavior be reported? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm sure, I'm, yeah, I'm sure they don't like that at all. I mean, given that they don't like helicopter disturbance, they probably would once in a while, it would not be a problem, but if it's a daily occurrence, it certainly would be an issue. Um, I don't, that's a really good question as to who to report it to. I don't know who regulates that, if that the Forest Service could do anything. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if we at Fishing Game, if we knew who it was, we could certainly, you know, call and ask them not to do it, but I can't say that it's illegal to do. Um, I don't know if that's a good answer because I'm not really sure I can answer that very well. No more questions actively coming in. Okay. Or we might be uh, out of questions here and uh, might be a good point to uh, conclude. And thank you very much for this presentation uh, on behalf of the Connect Connect Native Plant Society. We really appreciate you sharing all this information about mountain goats with us. And um, for everyone who's still, still online with us, uh, there will be a recording of this that will be put up on YouTube in the coming days. And uh, so if you have friends that haven't, haven't seen it, uh, direct them to that. We'll send that out to everyone. So if there's no other questions, wish everybody a good weekend. Thanks. I appreciate everyone uh, being here and, and interacting and sharing your Saturday morning with me.